You're listening to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast with Mike Chappell and Dave Griffiths. Hello and welcome to the Colts Blue Zone Podcast. I'm Matt Adams alongside Mike Chappell today. Dave Dave Griffiths taking a vacation on us this week, Mike. Did you get an invitation? I, I didn't. I didn't get an invica- invitation, and uh, while I'm not his direct manager, I did not get a vacation repro- uh, approval request either. Just total disrespect. At least to say, what do you guys think? Or, or at the very least... I'm going. Deal with it. But none of that. Yeah, or at least promise to bring us back something. Get us something out of we'll this, get a right? Mickey, we'll get a Mickey and a Minnie t-shirt on the way home if that's where they went. All right. So uh, we are going to talk Indianapolis Colts football, of course, today. The, we, we're going to talk the local pro day that the Colts held this week. I think that was Monday. We'll talk about Carson Steele, the former Center Grove running back. Julian Blackman officially resigning with the Colts. Uh, a little bit of an update on Anthony Richardson and his rehab, thanks to uh, both a video that I saw posted on social media and also a, a story from ESPN.com's Stephen Holder. And then a little bit, uh, we'll look into the mock draft outlook, just kind of a general overview of where things are. But let's start, Mike, with the Colts Pro Day. We had, what, uh, 58 players invited. Uh, most of, uh, All of them had some sort of local tie, whether they played for a, a state school or they were you know, a former high school player here in the area or whatnot. I don't know what the rules are, but it's 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 within a certain amount of radius f- from their school. Like this was like an Illinois pro day, Illinois, it, 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 IU, Purdue, Ball State, and, and then if if we look at the list, that's like Southern Illinois, it's Southern Mississippi, it's and these are local kids. Mm-hmm. I saw a Wabash, uh, Wabash right. uh, a kid, kid in from there too. a kid from Marion was there, Marion uh, University. Uh, I focused on Carson Steele, the running back who. If you're a movie buff, he looks like Thor. He he really does, and he's a big kid. He's like listed six one two twenty five. Center Grove, Mister uh, Football, back in twenty twenty, led Center Grove to the state championship, and went to Ball State for two years. And the second year, he was sixteen hundred yards, uh, led the MAC, ninth in the nation. Then he went to UCLA, wanted to play with the bigger guys, I get uh, bigger programs and all that, and he he was their leading rusher. 800 and some yards. So the, the, the pro days where you, again, it, it gives the Colts a really good chance to to hone in and get final ev- evaluations. They've done their work for months on this, and this gives you the chance to talk with the kids and, and see them work out, and, you know, it, uh, with eyeballs after you've already done, they've already seen a lot of these guys at the pro days and all this. So it's a it's a great opportunity. And we were talking before the air, They the Colts do this. Well, several years ago, five, six, seven years ago, maybe a little bit longer, they had a tryout day. I mean, a tryout day. You know, because you hear people say, oh, I could play football. I could do that. So they basically opened the doors and said, now, you had to have some, you know, competency, I think. Although, because there, there was one one guy, he was 30, 30-ish, and he was like a construction worker, and he took the week off because he wanted to come here to see if he could be like an offensive lineman, defensive lineman, and it was it was his dream. And then they they had some kid, a quarterback, and he couldn't play. He he simply couldn't play. Kevin Bowen and I were sitting there laughing at him uh, behind his back, obviously. But they had to had to take him out of drills because they couldn't evaluate tight ends and receivers because he couldn't throw the ball. But it, it, it was kind of a thing to say, hey, maybe you'll find that one guy who can – but it's more to say, so you think you can play, huh? Well, here, I'll show you that you can't. But it was a, it was a good gesture. But the things that we've gone through over the years, a, a tryout day where you see guys who think they can play and maybe they could back when in high school or early college but no longer can. And this is one of those things where, where – the Colts Pro Day this week was was not that because no. th- these were all invitees, people that the team had had some interest in or 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 what have you. So, and I mean, like you said, uh, you're kind of looking for a diamond in the rough, somebody who may be able to contribute to the team, whether it's special teams or give you some line depth or, or just take a flyer on a guy. And last year's attendees included Aiden O'Connell, who who got drafted. You had. Tyler Adams, who was a wide receiver from Butler. He didn't quite catch on with the Colts, but he almost did when they had a need at wide receiver. Uh, Payne Durham, the tight end from Purdue, drafted by Tampa. And then Juju Brents, and I'm sure Juju was already on the Colts' radar and everything, and it's not like he... He didn't participate because of the... Uh, he had, uh, was, wrist, wrist, wrist had, had, had wrist surgery. Yeah, and, and, but he, he was there. 
And then uh, Michael Tutsi also, who has uh, been on and off the Colts roster and has a reserve future contract with the team. So, again, not necessarily guys that are going to be your frontline players. That are, well, Juju is, but most of these are going to be guys maybe fill out some rosters, give a shot, give a guy a shot, see what he's got. Maybe you find something there that you didn't know you had before. Or like we were talking, it, it's, you get your, you, it's, it's about getting your foot in the door and getting a name recognition along with talent. But let, let's say that Chris Ballard and his personnel staff are, are, are aligning their, once the season starts, aligning receivers, 20 deep, what, whatever, because you never know if you get a, a, a rash of injuries at that spot. Well, you go to your board and say, who's out there? Not only who's out there, but who do we know about th- that's out there? So that it, it's, it's, it's value. And I saw a clip uh, that the Colts put out of Shane Steichen and Chris Ballard talking to these guys after we were there uh, on Monday. It was about two hours. And you see them, all the players circle around the coach and the GM, and they're telling these guys, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you're going to be a draft pick. Maybe you're going to be undrafted. Maybe you'll get a tryout for a mini camp. But it's all about doing what you can. This is, this is that latest audition. The combine is the all-time audition. That, that's when, you know, the CEO's there and you got to make a good impression. But th- this is – it's not as important, but it's important because, again, it, it gives – you're being watched by, by Chris Ballard and Shane Steichen. and Reggie Wayne's out there working with the uh, receivers, Cato G with the linebackers. And so it, it's really important for these guys – to, to get out there and play well, yes, but but just give the te- a, a team another reason to put you on their board. Again, whether it's a draft pick, whether it's an undrafted guy, or whether it's a guy that, you know, it, if something happens at a position, they know that I can come in and at least hold my own for a while. And Carson Steele's an interesting story because, you know, for a lot of these guys, maybe not – getting invites to that scouting combine and that makes this extra valuable which he did which he didn't because he i i'm, I'm thinking it was because he had a, a he had hernia surgery which i'm thinking maybe that played into it. but yeah there's no question uh there, there have been times uh it, it's been several years ago with the combine uh, i worked with uh when i was at the star with with ralph reef with with saint vincent sports medicine and they pre-trained these guys for the combine they did pre-combine they, they may have been one of the first to do it where they put these guys through all this is these are the drills you're going to see and so they put these guys through it and guys who didn't get you know uh, invitations to the combine that that week they would two or three of these guys would i think joe wrights was one of them where they 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 had a private workout at at st vincent's and teams show up baltimore ravens they show up for these private workouts because teams they have so many scouts, so many you know personnel guys, and if you can play, it's ninety nine percent sure they will find you. They, they'll know who you are, where you are, what you can do. So, any chance to get in front of teams and scouts and GMs and head coaches, you take advantage of it. And still strikes me as a guy who will run through a brick wall to, it, and, and he probably can. Literally, I think he really could. Yeah, uh, to to try to get himself uh, a sniff in the NFL. It, it's a, it's about getting your foot in the door. Uh, th- think of all the undrafted, and I always have a couple that come to my mind. A couple of these undrafted guys who, who, who have made a, a mark with the Colts. You know, Dominic Rhodes. You know, when when Edron James went down, Dominic Rhodes took over, and, and was a pretty good player for several years. Gary Brackett, undrafted, and and, and he was he was a, a cornerstone of those of the two thousands defense. So it's. Get your foot in the door, and, and then it's up to you. Once you get your foot in the door, it's up to you. But it, that, that's what – with the Carson Steele, he said, yeah, he said, they look at me as a bigger back, maybe block, catch the ball out of the backfield, special teams. So, so if a team in, in round six and round seven, probably round seven, or even the undrafted probably, – probably more of the undrafted guys, uh, which might be what he is facing, I don't know. But that's – I would think someone like Carson Steele, and every team and every market has these guys. The local guy who had a hell of a career, and he's not quite draftable. But those are the guys you sign after the draft. The roster goes to, you know, it's 90. It's 90. So, you know, you get you get a guy like that in camp, and then, and then he, he makes it difficult for you. Because once you get in camp, the thing is to give him a reason not to cut you. Right. Keep, keep me. This is why you should keep me. And there will be four or five or six players kept because of special teams. Now you got to be able to play corner or linebacker or running back, but 
special teams is super important, and it may be more important now with the, the, the new rule changes. And if you can just get into camp, because I know the big concern with Steele is probably straight line speed. He's listed as a fullback, the Colts, uh, on, on that uh, invite list. He was listed as a fullback. So his 40 time, not great. But if you can just get into camp, sometimes – that stuff disappears because when you're talking about game speed, is is sometimes it's so much different from just being able to run fast. And one thing that that'll work against him probably in the draft, I think his RAS score was a seven five. It was it was kind of low. I mean, when, when you're thinking about the the top things, but no, it's it's some players, it, whatever the the raw numbers are, that doesn't trans. It, 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 it's not the same when you get on the field. You play quicker. And your better reaction. So, so we'll see. You just hope someone like him, or like th- these other guys, at least get a chance to show what they can do. Yeah. Good. Good luck to, to Carson Steele and, and all the guys there at the pro day. Now we'll talk about somebody who we know will be on the Colts roster next year, and that is Julian Blackman. We'd heard last week that he was going to resign with the team. It officially happened this week on Tuesday, inking a one-year deal with the Colts. Uh, solves one of their problems at safety, but also we still would like to probably have some extra experience there in the backfield uh, in the secondary, but uh, good to have uh, Blackman back, and he spoke to the media this week. Yeah, he the Colts benefited from a, a, a lukewarm safety market by getting him back at, I think it's a one year, maximum $7 million uh, guaranteed, I think it's three and change, or the change is like Two hundred thousand dollars. That, that is what I read in your article. Yes. Uh, around there. So, so good change, uh, but I'd like to see them really double down on on the the lukewarm market by signing another veteran safety. There's and there's you know we mentioned there's still three or four of them that really really good guys that are not going to get the massive contracts. The big contracts by and large are done. I saw Josh Allen, the non quarterback Josh Allen, just got a monster contract extension from Jackson, but that's different. Free agents, I really think free agents have gotten the money they're going to get. So you could get you a veteran safety. Uh, Jamal Adams, I don't know. But the Justin Simmons, guys like that, maybe, you know, one year, six million. I would do that. And then I'm pretty well set at safety. And then Nick Cross is your third guy. Rodney Thomas is your fourth guy. So, But it, it, it does uh, uh, address that one area because I don't think they were going to – I really don't think they were going to draft the safety early – with the idea that he could be a potential starter. So this does, you know, it, it certainly, I, I'd say limit defections. It There's virtually no defections. Just one or two guys, Zach Moss and someone else. Yeah, G- Gardner. R- G- uh, Gardner meant you right. Uh, so it, it, great signing. And, and, and talking to him, you know, he was, he said, he, I asked him, I said, did, did, did the process frustrate? He said, well, not really. But, but then it was obvious that it did. Because he basically said he, he thought his value was more than a one-year contract. And I'm sure he was looking at two years, three years, and I don't know what the average is going to be, $10 million? I don't know. So, but, but he also agreed that failing a multi-year deal, that this is probably the best place for him. And we've talked about this. I mean, we, we, we talked that we thought he was going to be back. But if you can't get a, bit, a, a, a multi-year deal from somebody that – and you're going to have basically a one-year prove-it deal, why not go back to the place that you're going to start? You know the system. You're coming off your best year. So th- this will be, if he can stay on the field, this will be the best opportunity to have another, you know, to build on last year and then go into free agency next year when maybe the safety market is more robust. And, and maybe maybe it will be. You know, if you go to a different team and you have a different system and you don't necessarily adjust or adapt. Or, it takes or, you a year. You know, and, and then – then you're on your free agent contract, and then you have lost your value. Well, they where, say, yeah, why did you have a down year? Well, I, I was in a new well, – they don't want to hear that. Right. So th- th- this is a perfect situation for him. I realize he's at some level disappointed because he, he wanted to see what was out there. And I think the Colts said, well, yeah, go ahead. And, and it was a gamble. Normally when, when guys leave – the last guy that I can – we were talking, the last guy that I could remember that went out there – to see what they could get, and it just didn't work and came back, was was another safety, Clayton Gathers. And and it worked out pretty well that he came back here. So we'll see. And he's 25. He's 25 years old. So, you know, and yes, there's an injury his history, I guess, uh, an ACL at Utah his last year, and then he had the Achilles in year two, I think, here. Last year, the last two games with a shoulder injury, which 
I, I don't believe was serious. It just came at the end of the season when it took him too long to get. It would have taken him too long to get back. He said he's a hundred percent. So this is a good signing. It, th- this is this was one of the more important signings. If if we want to rank all these guys, he was to me a top three signing that they needed because of his age, his ability, and the position. And it's it is kind of interesting that that the safety market is a, is a bit depressed. I, I mean. He's 25 years old, and yeah, he's he banged up his shoulder at the end of last year, and I know he's got the two other major injuries, but it just kind of shows you how that all works together with uh, these veteran safeties being cut. It depresses the market, and so life what, is about timing. A, a guy that's off a career year can't get, and and I know that you know he's probably wanted a bigger deal than than what he got with the Colts, and that's why he's back with the team because he wasn't getting that from anybody else, even though he had visits with at least well, he a couple visited of the Buffalo and uh, uh, Frisco. I, yeah, those are the two that I can I can recall. And then uh, I know that uh, I listened to some of his, you know, uh, comments that he that he made afterwards and it sounds like it's I don't know necessarily a goal if you want to call it that, but he really wants to be able to play 17 games next year, show that he will be durable enough. What he to played do that. F- 15 last year. Yes. I think he played 16 the year before, yeah. which means he's missed 3 games in 2 years. So he's I he's not had a full Unfortunately, he's not had a full season right. yet in the league. But maybe this will be like Michael Penix. He has history issues also, but the last two or three years he hasn't. Right. The injuries were at, were at IU. So, but but it, it's it, it's the un, unfortunate and, un, and and cruel truth in the NFL is once you get a reputation, man, it sticks with it you. It sticks with you. It, and I think it probably played a factor in Blackman. It, it could very well have. You know, you don't know if – if he hadn't banged up his shoulder, would the Colts have been more willing for a multi-year deal? Or would somebody else have been willing to maybe pay him a little bit more to, to bring him there for a couple of years? Or, or, again, with the Colts the way they are, did they sort of have their value on him, realizing that he's probably not going to get a big number out there? And he said, okay, this this could very well be what they offered him. That could be. Could uh, be the same offer. Uh, back in March. On. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and he came back, and, and they certainly didn't, didn't lowball him. It's 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 a it's a good you know you get three million guaranteed and you can max it at seven. It's not what you know certainly he wanted. It's not what maybe in other years he would have gotten. But you know they signed a lot of guys for the one year one million. They certainly value him a lot more. That's and that's one thing they they as we've seen and it, it, as it riles up the fan base, they will reward their own. Maybe do a fault. I don't know. That that's we could we could spend the whole program talking about that. But they signed. Remember, they signed Zaire Franklin to that. Uh, was it a two year, three year, uh, ten million dollar contract? The, it, the special team standout a, contract. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, and he realized that, and they realized that that he outplayed it. And I was told, you know, they they said they we, we simply can't keep looking him in the face and having him play on that special teams contract. So that then he got three years, thirty some million, thirty nine. I don't know what it was, thirty some million. So th- they will take care of their own. And this is a, a guy who could very well be one of their own, if if you value safety enough in in your uh, in your priority list with your personnel. So, play well, and and most of the time you will be rewarded by by this franchise. We'd still like to see them add a veteran, uh, another veteran back there. I just think it would be good with uh, what we saw from the unit last year. Uh, well, somebody's going to get hurt. Absolutely, you know, yes. they, they get hurt, you're going to need your third or fourth safety to play. Yeah, so you, you'll need it for depth. Some experience would be good back there, too. So we'll we'll see uh, if they do anything. You know, they've still got a couple months to, to work on some stuff. And then we got, we got the draft coming up, too. I don't know that safety will necessarily be a focus, but you never know. I, I'd be surprised. I, I mean, they, they, they've got seven picks, although they'll come out of this with, what, nine? Yeah, c- pro- probably. Because they can't help themselves. Well, he can't help, them, help, yeah. help himself. I, I, we, we'll talk about draft a little bit later, but – just on that note, uh, in seven drafts, Chris Ballard has made 18 draft day trades. He loves them picks. Loves, loves them picks. It, it's funny how sometimes when, it, when a GM will, he'll give you that sound bite and it'll be, it, it could be on his uh, – he, he, and it's funny, he told <laughs> us how he always talked about roster building, about how offensive line, defensive line. And he sort of said one time, it'll be on my headstone. He drafted offensive linemen and defensive linemen. Or, or he made that a priority. So – that's why I don't think, and we're kind of going down a little rabbit hole here, but th- that's why people shouldn't be super surprised with how this offseason's gone. Julian Blackman is like the 11th of 15 or 11th of 14 
free, of their own free agents that have resigned with this team. Uh, Isaiah McKenzie uh, was another one. That okay, they, so it was McKenzie, Minshew, and uh, Zach Moss. There was one more, and I can't think of who it was. But th- th- this has been a stranger even for Ballard, the volume, uh, the number of players. You know, three or four of them got league minimum, but the rest of them got good money. So it was a it was a we were talking again at the out at the Colts complex for the pro day is how close they came to getting Daniel Hunter, and w- would the perception of their off season how would it have changed had they signed Daniel Hunter, the big guy for two two years fifty million whatever it would have been, but not resigned maybe Blackman. Maybe Grover Stewart. Grover's probably P- gone. P- pick two names. Probably would have been. Yeah. It would have taken two names. You you still would have done Pittman. You still would have had to do Zaire, uh, Tyquan Lewis. I don't know, but had they signed Daniel Hunter, two guys wouldn't be here. Probably uh, would that have satisfied people? I don't know. But th- this it, it's funny how when a guy tells you almost in, implicitly, this is how we're going to do things, and then he does it, and you seem surprised. You know, next year, uh, and I always think that next year has plays a role in what they do this year because you've got to look ahead. Uh, DeForest Buckner is going to be up next year. Everything that they've done tells me they're going to re-sign Buck because he's going to be 31. I've not seen an iota of slippage. Yeah, no no drop-off I've seen. Well, you if you watch the de- defensive tackle market, it's, what, 22, 23 million? And then if Bernhard Ryman has another good year, you got to play your left tackle. And that's I don't know fifteen sixteen million so so it it, 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 it it it's intertwined, but f- I guess fortunately for the fan base, there's no other re- cult to resign, so they're they, you know they're done they're done they're, in, they're done they're they're done there I they, they can't I don't know who else they could even think about resigning bringing back so, but Blackman was good he 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 he, he got, they got him for probably their price, and at the position that they had. To bring somebody in, as as we said, I would still go out and get another veteran safety because you let the market settle down and you bring in a pretty good player at your price. And we move from the defensive side to the offensive side, and I saw a video uh, this week posted by uh, let's see, it was Cortex Sports Performance, which is where Anthony Richardson is doing his rehab, and they kind of had this uh, video segmented for day one of his rehab. It's just little soft tosses and into then, a net. Then you know, then week eight, and here's airing it out, throwing some zip on the ball. He's throwing good. 30, 40 yards, yeah. with with zip on it. And so uh, Stephen Holder, ESPN.com, Stephen Holder did go and, and follow AR to some of his rehab and had a pretty nice article uh, about you know how uh, how he's doing in, in his rehab and, and what it's taken to do it, and and also sort of teaching himself to slow it down. Just a little bit. He, he they, wants to, he wants to run through that wall, but he's kind of learning some life perspective. I want to have a long career. You know, I've got I've got a, a child now, and I need to make sure that everything gets taken care of. I, I, and I'm sure again, the Colts open their off season work uh, Monday, I believe mm-hmm. it is. The first couple of weeks are just it's strength conditioning and rehab. But but they can you know quarterbacks can get out on the field and throw it around. You just can't have any kind of structure at all. They're going to have to hold him back. They just are. And that's fine because he doesn't need to be ready April 15th. He needs to be ready like in June for OTAs. That's when you're end of May, I guess. So, But they're not going to push him. He doesn't really need to be ready until training camp. But I think it's I think it's now, I'll, I'll change it. He needs to be ready for OTAs to where he takes most of the reps because he probably had – no, zero – he probably had zero practices with Jonathan Taylor. Maybe one or two that the, the game, what was the t- Tennessee game, the fifth week of the season, mm-hmm. maybe a few that week. But no off-season workout, no training camp. You know, and Taylor's missed the first month or so. So, And then Michael Pittman, every rep they get will be invaluable with, with the skill people. Pittman, Pierce, Josh Downs, all these guys. So, I, I But I, everything that you've seen – is incredibly encouraged. There, there shouldn't be any. Well, you know, he he might be ready for your OTAs. No, he's going to be ready for your OTAs. It'll be how much. And Shane Steichen told the guys in, in, at the owners' meetings that they're going to monitor him. They have to. This this is this is the long term view you have to take. But at the same time, he needs he needs to do more than just 
you know, minor stuff during the off-season workouts because this is going to be your guy. And he's he's been back and forth. He's been in India a little bit. He's been down in, in Florida as well. And I'm not exactly sure what the timeline is uh, in the article. It's not necessarily clear, but he came to Indianapolis uh, to kind of for a progress report, more or less, and threw in front of the, the staff. And, you know, they were just kind of – Ballard was almost like, I can't even believe this this kid was injured. Right. You know, because right. he he's, he's apparently has gotten that zip back on the ball. And, and, that's, and that's what that latest video showed you at the end of it. He was chucking up pretty good. And Stephen – one of the good points Stephen had in his story – he, he, I think, the, I think it was then in Jacksonville, after the owners' meetings, and it was really a good get by Stephen. But he, he pointed out how at the end of a couple of the, the workouts is, okay, you're going to throw this pattern three times or whatever, and and it wasn't quite to where Richardson wanted it to be as far as precise, and he kept wanting to do more and more and more. Finally, they basically took the football away from him. Yeah, because he's he's on a pitch count, but he's he's right. going past the pitch count right. because he wants to get it. Wants to get it right. He wants well, to get on that good hit. The pitch count. Throw. The pitch count was twenty, but you're at twenty four. I'll do two more. No, you're already four over your pitch count. So that and that's and that's a good thing. It's a good thing that they're going to have to and that during his rehab now they have to hold him back because if you let a player go out there, he'll he'll just destroy his rehab. Absolutely. He will. I feel pretty good today. Well, you're supposed to, but then tomorrow you may not feel that good. Well, and I think there's some there's some belief that if you don't feel good, well, you're supposed to. Fight through it. Well, maybe your body's telling you that it's not quite ready to take that step. Everything that I've seen and read uh, when, when we talked to Richardson back in January is he's he's not on schedule. He's ahead of schedule. And, again, the only schedule that matters is to be ready at some level uh, next week and then really be ready to go in, in, in May. And I think he will be. And then uh, also uh, Holder went – or Steve, Stephen Holder went with him to his uh, – kind of his, his workout session. Not, not the, the throwing rehab, but the workout stuff. They have, have him doing some unique things with the medicine ball for, for strength, strength training and then uh, doing a lot of flexibility and range of motion stuff as well as, as in addition to probably some standard weight lifting. We well. saw the range of motion and was it the uh, – Was it Florida, the Florida game? The Florida the, game yeah. at the, the first two round games here yeah. and he's, he's windmilling pretty good. So every, every everything. This isn't like a, a former quarterback here where the progress reports as well as he throwing Nerf balls yet. Is he throwing a regulation football yet? So, uh, to me, every sign is positive. Whether we talk to AR next week, I don't know. That's being discussed. Whether we get him next week, the first day. We, we get players, I think, on Tuesday, I think it is. Whether we get AR that day or whether it's a week or two later, I don't know. But everyone should be encouraged. You know, we're, and we're not talking about it. Is he going to be the guy? Is he going to do what C.J. Stroud did? No, we're just saying that this guy's back should be back to where he can do what he does. And again, I think we saw enough last year in the small sample size that he, he looks like he could be the guy. But if he's back healthy, then he has a chance to be that guy. And I, I know that a, a lot of fans, if you, you read message boards and 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 Twitter slash X or, or what have you. Uh, fans not real happy with the Colts off season. Uh, a lot of them, you know, just kind of bring it back to the same guys. This is a team that went nine and eight. They missed the playoffs. You know, we're just going to get the band back together and essentially put the same team on out there. And I, I understand that there were some quality free agents out there. And uh, Legarius Sneed would have been a nice trade, I think, for, for to help with that cornerback. Uh, Daniel Hunter would have been good off of the edge. And and I, so I, I I understand these things as well. Uh, but they kept a lot of really good players, I felt like. And then the thing that's really exciting is if, and it's a big if, but if Richardson is able to perform at the level that he was last year in that little glimpse that we saw, he's going to be a dynamic player in the NFL. And people need to try to keep that in mind in the back of their heads. That Basically, last year was a flyer that they, they took on him. It looks like it's going to pay off. We do need to see the results on the field, obviously. It, it, there's no doubt in my mind from from having talked to Ballard and Steichen and just how they've addressed it. They haven't said it flat out, but they're putting so much on on if you want to call it running the guys back out there that having Richardson back will make that type of a difference. They, they talk about explosive plays. That's what he brings. He just does, whether it's throwing, whether it's running. What do you have? Four rushing touchdowns last year in four starts. Uh, so so what what might he have done? In a longer, and then keep in mind, it's Richardson and it's Jonathan Taylor. 
your your two best offensive players, you know, with all due respects to to Quentin Nelson and 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 Pittman, these are the two guys that have got the great players, the the Jordans and the LeBrons. They they make everyone around them better, and that's what you're expecting from Richardson. Which again, there's something of a leap of faith there. There really is mm-hmm. because yeah. there's belief. You've got to have belief. 173 snaps, you know, and and with Taylor, you know, he played 11 games last year. I'd say he was probably JT for eight of them, uh, with, with the, the the prolonged ankle rehab slash contract <laughs> uh, in, in contract. So. So they played – I've been saying one play. They, they played together two plays in the Tennessee game. There was a one three-yard rush, and then he was in there for pass protection, and he really did nothing. So th- th- they're really expecting Richardson to be that guy and provide the – ups and downs, yes, because of the lack of, of game experience. But, uh, you know, it, it's one of those, well, if Minshew took us here, where will this guy take us? I mean, there's no com- – and, and we're not here to – Trash Gardner Minshew. We, we say that disclaimer almost. Every, I, I, every I feel I feel obligated to, but again, if he can do this, what what can this guy do? You know, again, I, fourth and two against uh, Houston, would AR have com- converted that? Oh, probably so. Now you still would have had trouble with the secondary and all the stuff that they did that Stroud did. And, and again, Taylor played probably at full strength eight games, and and when he was good, he was really good. So that that changes the, dyni- the, the, the dynamics of an already pretty good offense. Where what were they tenth in scoring? Mm-hmm. Which yeah. is which it, is it, one it, of the it still blows my mind that the Colts hung in there at, as a top ten NFL scoring team based on what they had to deal with last. Right, and, and you're adding to that, expecting Pippen to get better. So so there, there's all, everything's intertwined. Did that keep them from going heavier in free agency? Well, again, they they made us as almost as strong of a push as you can on Hunter without getting him. And I, I'm, I've, if we've talked, I believe the $48 million guaranteed was was a non-starter. They, they said, nah, that's a bridge too far. We'll give you, I don't know, 30 I can't believe they thought about a $48 million guarantee. So, but that, no, but that's, they're either going to be right or not. In, in all that they've done, I don't care if they brought in Hunter and Snead and still found a way to bring everybody back. If the quarterback isn't the right guy, what do you got? You know, and that's not to discount Joe Flacco because going into the season right now, not if you didn't know what ha- was going to happen last year, would you rather have Joe Flacco or Gardner Minshew? Well, I'll take Flacco. You know, and for for five weeks, he was everything they needed in Cleveland. And, and then it sort of came off. You know, I don't want to see Joe Flacco play 17 games. I really don't. But I think for a month, he'll be pretty good. So, uh, but th- that so much of what the, every, everything is tied together. But at the core of this, I really believe is they believe we're getting the quarterback back and we're getting JT back, and they're going to do just so much more. That they, they keep you know and just go back to was it 2021 when JT led the league in rushing. Yeah. He he was of course then all that he did they didn't make the playoffs, which <laughs> shows you the value of a running back if the other pieces aren't there. But they really believe those two pieces are the main reasons they'll take that next step. So there's plenty of reason for optimism and, and we'll hopefully not have to have that optimism crushed at any time during training camp and preseason and all that. So hopefully everybody stays uh, healthy and, and, and behaves themselves. Uh, we do have a, a little uh, event called the NFL Draft coming up in a couple of weeks, Mike. Two weeks tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. April the 25th. It'll be in Detroit this year. Uh, the Colts currently have the 15th overall pick in the draft. Uh, there are that, a should lot be, of that should be a prop bet on whether they stay at 15 or – they're not going to go up. That, that, that's not going to happen. But go back four or five spots, maybe. Now, uh, Colts.com, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Is it, uh, J- it's JJ. J- JJ Stankovitz or yep. Stankovitz. Um, does this thing on every Monday, uh, Mock Draft Monday, and he goes and he scours, uh, basically does our homework for us. So big thanks to him on that. Uh, goes and scours some of the different uh, mock drafts and the experts and what they're saying about the Colts. Uh, this week on Monday, he tracked 19 different mock drafts. And so I just had a few little takeaways from this. 
Uh, six of the 19 have the Colts taking an offensive player. 13 of the 19 have them going defense. Uh, your top names, uh, Quinion Mitchell, not, uh, not Quentin as I have Quinion. mistyped here. It is Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo. Brock Bowers, Brian Thomas Jr. out of LSU uh, are uh, each in three different mock drafts. I believe Terry Arnold's uh, cornerback from Alabama is in a couple. And then Cooper DeJean from Iowa is in a couple as well. Uh, 19 of the mock drafts have the Colts taking a cornerback. That is obviously people looking at the Colts ten roster of the, ten, based ten, on ten of the nine, 10 of the 19. Yep, 10 of the 19 right. uh, have the Colts taking a cornerback, and that's obviously based on people looking from the outside in, looking to the Colts, saying that uh, their secondary wasn't good this year, they don't really have much experience at cornerback, and so to uh, mitigate that problem at cornerback, uh, they need to take a cornerback. If they take a cornerback at 15, he's a starter. Absolutely, he'd have to be. 100%. Well, they, they took Juju in the second round last year, and he was going and to be a starter. And he was going to be a starter, and, right. and just injury stuff kind of right. uh, derailed his ability to, to get some playing time for the Colts. Uh, of those uh, cornerback options, I did note that Cooper DeJean and Quinion Mitchell had the highest relative athletic scores uh, for their position uh, with uh, virtually tied. Um, the interesting thing is they, they are both under 6'1". Most of the cornerbacks that they have, uh, that the mock draft uh, folks have the Colts taking, uh, are not quite the Chris Ballard type, uh, the long-armed uh, big corners that we the, the typically Juju. see. That we, of course, Juju's got like 34-inch arm uh, right. span. It's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so some of these guys are a little bit smaller. But, you know, uh, he also, uh, Ball he being Ballard, also uh, values athleticism. So if you're looking pure, pure athleticism, then Cooper DeJean and, and Quinion Mitchell seem to be kind of your, your, where you would kind of go toward. And, and again, I, I see all these. One I thought was crazy. I don't remember the guy's name. And I would, if I remembered, I wouldn't mention it. Had him taken a defensive tackle, the, the kid from uh, Texas. Yes. Is yep. it Murphy? By Byron Murphy. Yep. They they just signed Grover Stewart thirty million. They they re-signed Tyquan Lewis at twelve million. They're going to probably re-sign Buck. So that that's one position. I just as as much as Batter believes you can't have too many. That would be a, a bridge too far for me. I would still and this is that I've always my disclaimer. I would be an awful GM because I would ignore the best player and I go to where I think I really need it. And I would, I would, although in this draft you wouldn't have to force it. I like receiver at fifteen because I want to, I want to give the, the quarterback every opportunity to succeed. And right now, to me, they've got three, they've got two, two proven receivers with Pitt and Downs, Pierce. You think, but you don't know. And I would think a, a receiver in three or four of these guys have. Great outside speed. Uh, who was it? Brian Thomas. Did he lead the college football with seventeen touchdowns? I think it was, or whatever. That's, that sounds right, but don't don't quote. I me. know. So so, but but I understand that, that what they what they probably and what smart people would do, which means that I'm not a smart person, is is take a corner at fifteen and find a pretty good receiver at forty six or whatever they are. Maybe maybe if it, if you're at forty six and you see a guy there. You do like you did with uh, Jonathan Taylor. You you move you move up three or four spots in the second round. But to me, they've got to come out of the first two rounds with a a passing option. If Brock Bowers falls to him at fifteen, you take him. You just take him. But you've got to come out of here with a starting corner and a receiver who can who can receiver a pass catcher who can make a difference in his first year. And, and a lot of people say Bowers is as good as a, a wide receiver as you're going to get in the, the draft. I mean, he's not going to have wide receiver speed, but it's pretty close. Uh, and he's capable of, of pretty much doing anything that you want him to do out on the field. Uh, interestingly, a couple of the drafts had the Colts trading up with Denver to get Bowers. I don't know. It's, again, it's just I think Bowers could make that much of a difference because I'm old enough to remember Dallas Clark and that – team in the 2000s was much more loaded offensively mm -hmm. to where yeah. Clark Clark probably was the missing piece. I don't know that Bowers is the, the missing piece. You still have some deficiencies, but boy what what the how many times have we seen what the, the what that player you know is it I'll blow his name uh, Pakua the, the the Rams guy. 
Puka Nakua. P- 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 From Puka Grams, yeah. Nakua. I'll have to do spell it and not pronounce it. But they, they just create problems. Um, Mark Andrews. Yes, Kelsey and Kittle and all those guys. But what those guys can do, and we saw the Colts have problems with those guys. So you're, to me, you'll have to move up to get him. And then what's the cost of moving up? Probably more than Ballard wants to pay. It's one thing to move up from whatever they were uh, in, in, in Jonathan Taylor's year to, to, to go four or five spots to 44 in, in round two as to move up three or four spots in round one. That gets prohibitive. Now, we'll talk about this probably once we get uh, closer to the draft, which uh, in our next podcast. But uh, I did look at Ballard's seven drafts that he's had with the Colts, and he's gone offense um, in four of them first and then defense in three of them. Uh, all of them uh, good players, uh, Malik Hooker, Quentin Nelson, Rock Yassin, uh, Michael Pittman Jr., Quiddy Pay, Alec Pierce, Anthony Richardson, obviously, those last couple of recent selections, so they're still on the team. Uh, Malik Hooker just didn't work out uh, for the Colts from an injury perspective, and then they traded Rock Yassin. So. Right. So, so, yeah, and they I, were good players. I, right, right. Now, again, I think they've had trouble finding edge pass rushers because they, they've, they've, mm-hmm. they, they've, they've, they've been Banigou, Kimiko, Ture, and – some right. other guys, but but by and large, I, I think it's been, he's had he's had a good draft history. They missed on some early corners. Quincy Wilson yes. com, comes to mind. Uh, so so, but it's that's why again the draft. I think what if if a team is smart, what you try to do is you try to you, you know what your priorities are going in going into the offseason. You just you you meet with your people and you say, okay, this is where we are. Where do the coaches and coordinators? Where do you believe? We are, you know, strengths, weaknesses. And if, if you're allowed, address the first step is free agency. You know, of, of, yeah, sign, re-sign your own, yes. Don't create holes where, they, where there wasn't one. But then try to address things in free agency, which the Colts did not do. No. And then the draft is sort of the final thing to where you can say, okay, we didn't get this. We gotta, we've got to get this. So, but they'll come out of here with, with two or three good players, and they've been pretty good about finding guys late in the draft as well. Zaire Franklin, I mean, he he's my new Gary Brackett. You know, Brackett wasn't drafted, but here's Zaire was, as I always stress, he wasn't just a seventh round linebacker for the Colts. He was their second seventh round uh, draft pick that year. Remember Matt Adams? Yeah, I do remember Matt Adams. So, and it, it, again, it's kind of where we, we start about getting your foot in the door. Get into a camp and then work your way up. And, and there's not one or two stories. There's bunches of stories of guys who outplayed being an undrafted guy, who outplayed being a, a seventh-round draft pick. We always have the Tom Brady, uh, Brock Purdy. You know, get your foot in the door and do something. But if you can play, they're not going to cut good players. Now, first and second-round draft picks – are going to have a longer leash. Yeah, they'll have some grace period. On right, them. but third on down, if you can't play, you can't play. And if somebody deserves to be kept over that guy, that's what they'll do. I mean, we saw that with Darius Rush. They they decided they liked Jalen. Did they cut him the day or the week after he had his pick six? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, he had a he had a really impressive preseason game and then gone. Because they because they don't look at those as much as they do. Training camp, off-season workouts, practices, right. and that, that's what you make your decisions on. They have a lot more information to work from than, than those of us who just kind of – Than our eye test on, on right. Saturday or Sunday in a preseason game. Yeah, we're like, oh, yeah, that guy is fast. We should keep him. See ya. Yeah, you know. So um, you mentioned Zaire Franklin. Uh, he was uh, acquired when the Colts traded Henry Anderson to the Jets. That got them that pick. They turned that pick into Zaire Franklin. Uh, they did that again in 2020. They traded Quincy Wilson – to the Jets, and they got Isaiah Rodgers out of that pick. Now, again, Rodgers didn't work out for the Colts, not because of anything that happened on the field, but because of what happened off the field to him. But, like, good move. It worked out. Right. And, and generally speaking, I know the Colts don't play the game in free agency the way that a lot of people would like them to and, and get splashy names and all that stuff. When it comes to draft day stuff, Chris Ballard is about as savvy as they get. They, they get more picks – they they don't hit on everybody and nobody hits no, on the more, everybody. The more picks you have, the the greater chance. If you're going to hit forty percent, I'd rather have forty percent of ten picks and forty percent of you know six or seven picks. I mean, look look at the trade they made with the Jets for the third overall pick back in 2018. Uh, the Colts had the third pick. Uh, they traded down with the Jets. They got three second round picks out of that trade. Uh, they end up 
getting Quentin Nelson at sixth. He's been a, a franchise cornerstone. Also, Braden Smith taken with that year's second round pick. He turned another second round pick uh, and another trade down into Ture and Jordan Wilkins. Now, Ture right. didn't work out. Wilkins was a pretty Wilkins good player. Wilkins was a pretty good player for the Colts. And, and Ture, you know, could have worked out. It just it didn't. And then they got another second round pick in 2019 out of that deal that became Rocky Asin. I'd bring him back. So, I, I mean, it's th- there are a lot of things like this. And then when, when Ballard has traded up, the players that he has traded up for, Tyquan Lewis, uh, Kari Willis, uh, uh, Jonathan Taylor, and Nick Cross. Right. So, again, Nick Cross, a work in progress. Uh, Kari Willis retired early. But none of those were in the first round. And none of them were in the first round, and that's another important thing. So. Yeah. Um, when they do trade up, it tends to be in those third, fourth round, uh, second rounds where they get a guy that they think they're kind of getting, you know, first or second round talent for, you know, X price or whatever. What year was Willis? Uh, Willis, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, 2019. Okay, so right now he he should be one of your starting safeties. Right. I mean, that, that's how you draft things. And he opted to go into missionary work. So you know but you, you the team can't you can't, can't know you that. can't know that you can't know that. So but uh, so the, there ha- there have been misses there have been misses again the, the the edge rushers jump out at me, but uh, by and large that's why I think people but, but that's why I keep defaulting to if Richardson is the right guy a lot this stuff will should work, and if it, if it, if he's not the guy, and after a month of the season he's just flailing away which is not going to be the case. Same like in Tennessee. We've talked about in Tennessee. If Will Levis isn't the guy in Tennessee, they're dead for six years. You just are. So I, I, I like the moves. I would like to have seen another veteran free agent. I'd still like to see a – I wouldn't mind a veteran receiver. I wouldn't mind a veteran corner or safety. But they're not done yet. But it's just – it's hard nowadays with all of the glut of social media info – it's hard to be patient, but that's what, to some level, you have to be. And, and in terms of patience, okay, 2019, Ballard traded the 26th overall pick to Washington. Then he traded down again, got another pick. Those picks ended up being Ben Banigou and Marvell Tell. Okay, eh, not, not great. Not, but, not so good. But the 2020 pick from that deal, Michael Pittman Jr. Yeah, it, so, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny how, because was it the year with Ben Banigou where some of the receivers taken or some of the players taken after him? We're pretty good players. Yeah, pretty good players. So, and, and you can drive yourself crazy. Absolutely. With every, the second draft guessing. is like that. There's right. some guy that we we passed over, and now he's a five time pro. Well, and, and I always say it's the extreme, but the Patriots passed on Tom Brady five times before taking him in round six. Right, and every other team passed right. on him. So, so if if Tom Brady wanted to have a a revenge tour, it would have started in Foxborough. But but no, it's it's but it's fun to do, it, and it does fuel the interest in the draft and what the NFL does and, and you know, but I'll be glad when these, these two weeks are over, because again, you get over overwhelmed by information. It, it's the old uh, paralysis by analysis. And all of a sudden J, J, people have JJ McCarthy going fifth. So suddenly he's the number one pick of the draft. He's, un- not. Un- he's, un- he's, un- he's not, but he has gone, he has skyrocketed up the draft. And, and Drake may has kind of slid and, I still see, and I won't be shocked, if six quarterbacks go before the Colts are on the clock. And Colts fans, that is exactly the what only thing that would be better is if like seven, if Michael Penix right. works his way up there. So, uh, but but desperate desperate teams do desperate things. That's why there's probably more misses on top fifteen quarterbacks than there are hits because you just don't know when you, you you're just afraid to pass on that guy who might be. Then the next guy again. The Colts don't know about Richardson. The Titans don't know about uh, Will Levis. Will Levis in Carolina certainly doesn't know about Bryce Young. No. How could they? How could they know anything and, about and, Bryce And Young? if six quarterbacks go in the top 13, 14 picks, two of them aren't going to make it. History says three of them probably aren't going to make it. But you just can't be the team that passed on, I don't know, Patrick Mahomes. Yeah. That's the, the, the one position where teams will reach, it feels Overdraft. like, annually – is quarterback because of the the contract flexibility that gives you and the fact that if you do hit, then your franchise is probably set for a decade. But also very hard to do. 
uh, for that to happen. Well, that's what we go back to say that the, the football god shined on on Jim Irsay with with Peyton Manning and mm-hmm. Andrew Luck. You, it had to be right time, right place. You know, things things had to fall in place for Peyton for them to, to be in a position to get Peyton. And similarly with Luck, that did so. And then they sort of paid had to go through their the rough period, almost like you're paying you're you're having to pay for what you got earlier. But if you get the guy, that guy gives you a chance. And without him, you're just everything. Everything is a struggle, and it's so hard to win without a quarterback who can c- carry the day for you. And that's just kind of the great thing about the upcoming coming season, from from my perspective, is they don't have to go in and try to pencil in who's going to be our QB one, right? And who's going to be QB one next year? Well, they didn't, and the year after that, they knew, but they didn't announce QB one until August. True. Whatever that first week of August, when it's funny, I talked to Minshew, and he said, "Yeah, I'm disappointed." Really. <laughs> you thought you were coming here and it was a level playing field. But that that's why I say it's important for Richardson to be out there when they really start cranking up like phase three of OTAs of, of the offseason. And then he's – because he's your guy. He needs the work. He needs to work with the, with the rest of the team. All signs point to that. All right. So uh, first day of offseason work is Monday, April the 15th. That's also tax day and the WNBA draft. So just Or, a, or the K- Caitlin Clark Day. K- K- Caitlin Clark Day, for those of you who celebrate the Indiana fever. Uh, they'll have offseason workouts May 21st, uh, 23rd, May 29th to 31st. Mandatory mini camp for the Colts June 4th through 6th, April the 25th to the 27th. The NFL draft again in Detroit. And uh, we still haven't heard anything about this fifth year option. On Quiddy Pay, but uh, as Mike often th- says, is it thirteen four, thirteen four million? I, I think, think that's what uh, what we came to, um, and th- they still have to make their decision on whether or not they're going to pick up that fifth year option on Quiddy Pay, and that decision has to be done by May the second. So uh, you know we won't know probably until we get there because, as Mike often says, deadlines spur action. And, and you, th- to me, there's no doubt that Ballard and his guys know what they're going to do, and unless they, if a defensive end falls to them. Is there would, – would that impact what you do with Quiddy so Pay? Th- they'll, they'll have time because the, the draft obviously happens before the deadline, so they can kind of figure out what they want to do there. I just don't think $13 million is is exorbitant for your for a top-edge pass rusher. Although, he, again, when you say, would you pay that for, for Jabal shared early in his career? I mean, probably. So uh, that's still – whether you, you draft a de- defensive end or not, I still think the price tag for Quiddy's fifth year is 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 livable. Yeah, I, I think so, and and we'll just like I said, we'll we'll know in a couple of weeks. Well, that'll wrap up this edition of the Colts Blue Zone podcast for Mike Chapel and Dave Griffiths, who again ditched us for vacation in How Florida. Hey, Dave, hope it's sunny and you know warm down there. <laughs> hope you had a good time down there because it is wet. Family. It's wet and chilly yeah, up here. It's, it's been not so wonderful here. Uh, but I'm Matt Adams, and that wraps up this edition of the Colts Blue Zone podcast. <laughs>